Hello. All right. So I think it's stop. It's time to start. 2:25. Uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining today. And uh, Kem and I uh, are going to talk about. Uh, uh, the Octo project and uh, the uh, RDK and uh, what uh, what we've been uh, working on a couple of years ago and what is actually still a very active project. Of course. Sorry. Okay, first, a quick introduction. So my name is Nicolas Duchesne. I work uh, for Linaro and uh, where I do a bunch of Linux and uh, Yocto OpenMLE related stuff, and I'm also the uh, community manager for the Yocto project. Um, so um, I'm Ken Raj, I work at Comcast. Um, I basically uh, am a uh, RDK architect, primarily responsible for all open source activities around RDK. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, both Comcast and Linux worked together um, on, uh, I mean, with the RDK uh, software, which is the uh, set-top box stack, which is actually used by Comcast and, and other um, MSO. And we actually uh, worked and took the, what we used, used to be the RDK before, and we actually migrated everything to the Yocto project uh, using all the practices and everything from the Yocto project. So that's basically the. The reason of the talk today is to show what one very specific um, ecosystem has been able to do and to build with the Yocto project. We are going to talk about, I mean, what is the Yocto project in case some people don't know, what's the RDK, uh, some of the issues that we had before, uh, and wh why we actually ended up choosing the Yocto project to actually uh, use as a baseline for the, for the RDK. Um, and then uh, what happened? So we started and we started to deploy and work with the Yocto project and what are the benefits and actually also the challenges that uh, we've had both from the Yocto project side and from the, from the RDK side. So what is the Yocto project? Uh, so that could be a very long discussion, uh, but uh, we are going to make a very short uh, picture. So basically that's a, that's a tool set. So that's a set of tools, a set of processes uh, that ba allows you to build your own Linux. So whether you want to do a small Linux, a large Linux, whether you want to do that for the embedded space, for cloud, for anything, containers, uh, you, when you need to build your own Linux, you have the choice to either use an existing Linux from an, an existing vendor, or you can actually use tools to make your own. So that's the very high level pitch about what it is. Uh, it allows you to make your own Linux and customize the way you want. So you can do anything with that after that. So in terms of the project itself, so it's a, it's a Linux Foundation project. It's been hosted since uh, 2010. Um, the Richard Purdy has been uh, the main architect. I don't, he's here this week. I don't see him in the room, but um, he's been the main uh, architect and the committer for the project since, I mean, since it started. Uh, it uses the Yocto project build system. It's basically open embedded. So there is a very strong relationship between the two open source projects, the open, open embedded and, and the Yocto project. If you have any questions about that, I mean, you can always come and ask us. Um, it's basically support all kind of major uh, architecture. I mean, in ARM x86, uh, MIPS 6.5, I mean, everything that exists today is pretty much supported by the project. It has become uh, one of the main uh, system which is used today to build Linux. Uh, it started from the embedded space, and what we see now, it's actually used more and more outside of just the embedded space. We make releases twice a year, uh, April and October. We actually just made the Yocto release 3.0 release a couple of days ago. Why people should be using uh, something, uh, I mean the Yocto project? Uh, basically the idea is that if you build your own Linux uh, and if you end up with your own tools and own set of scripts or whatever, I mean, just call what it is, uh, you are basically spending all your time building your own build system. So, by using some standard uh, tools and processes, uh, it comes with recipes, it comes with uh, uh, processes, and you can have updated, up-to-date uh, recipes for pretty much every software that exists in Linux. I mean, with uh, all the, the components that you need to build your own user space, have their own recipes, uh, most likely already existing and already supported by, by the community. You can very quickly uh, build uh, your entire image and, uh, and, and get started with, with a very standard Linux system. Uh, we have uh, support for package management uh, for like advanced use cases where you actually do need to use packages or um, make binary packages. That's something which is also possible and uh, which is most of the time not 
possible to do by hand. And uh, predict predictable. So basically, if you build today, I mean, there is a high chance that you will be able to build, I mean, next month, the same thing that you build. So that's actually all the goodness and the things which are built in and, uh, and given for free to you uh, by when you start using the project. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's used quite, I mean, so it, there, is, there is a membership around the Yocto project, so there are many companies that actually sponsor and use the Yocto project, so basically by relying on that project, you use something which is standard and, and standard in the industry. Uh, it's flexible, so even though I mean uh, you can you can actually build completely the the, the the Linux system. It's completely flexible in the sense that you can customize any package that you include. Uh, you include the upstream packages, and you choose how you compile, uh, which piece of the system you need for your for your use cases, and you can actually tailor your image to exactly what you need. Okay. So um, you're going to talk about RDK. So essentially, um, what you see here is a um, RDK video stack, um, but essentially that's where we started. RDK is essentially our home operating system. Um, that is actually started with video, but right now we'll talk about it a bit more. There are more profiles we have. But this is just a high level uh, picture that you'll see how, what are different components that are in there. So you got like certain OEM based components so this is a software stack, of course, but you know these are like kind of various owners that contribute to RDK stack, and uh, and then you see in the middle there is the RDK stack essentially, um, and as you can see there are many components in there, uh, and obviously you have application layer on top where you have all your UI and, and other uh, applications. Um, the what you can see in there is that uh, there is a um, a lot of open source components that are in there. So um, now given this, um, what we had was to give you a little uh, history, and there was a RDK build system that we had earlier on. And uh, eventually we basically got onto um, um, Yocto project and Nico just listed a few of the reasons. Uh, I'll go over those uh, in, in, um, uh, in short, but um, when RDK started, uh, it had its own build system, like we all do many times. That's how we start. And uh, it was called RDK Build System, very innovative name. Um, and it started fine. Uh, you know, they were like bash scripts, grew into Python, uh, and then various other things. So people started adding you know, their own build logics and it just went at 300 miles an hour, no documentation. After a while, even you know, the people who wrote it would have to refer to their memory, and they were not finding the answers. Um, so it became very difficult to maintain, uh, right? So um, obviously, it's easy to snapshot the components, but then it's hard to maintain them later on. So if you snapshot Linux kernel, that's fine, but then you want to upgrade, then you have your own patches, you have other patches. So you end up basically in a very weird situation where your velocity um, is impacted. Um, and obviously, you know, there are other tasks, not only upgrades, you are scaling, you are building new products. Um, so essentially, build is the last thing you want to be doing, right? So, or developing. Uh, sooner or later, there was a realization that the project had that uh, build is not the differentiation that RDK has. So it's better to use something and share with the rest of the community. Um, so uh, essentially, I think what Nico is going to tell you is basically um, what 1.x looked like in terms of high-level architecture from RDK's point of view and then how we transformed it into Yocto eventually. So it's, it's quite easy to understand uh, that if you make your own build system, which is very difficult to use and so on, that's a problem. Uh, not upgrading your system very often is a problem. But there is a biggest issue that we, we had before is that because everything was so complicated, uh, what uh, ended up happening is that uh, we, we ended up with this very weird pyramid where most of the software that was actually in the product in the end came from the baseboard vendor, which is 
I mean, almost the opposite of what you would expect. I mean, you expect from the, the vendor. I mean, of the, the vendor, uh, the BSP vendor is basically whoever provides the SOC where this stuff is going to run. The only thing you expect from the vendor is more or less like a Linux kernel, which is one very small piece of the problem. But what we've seen is that the build system was so complex to use uh, that the SDK that came from the, every vendor started to grow and grow and grow. So uh, every vendor that was working with the RDK, they started to add the Linux kernel, and then the BusyBox, and then they started to add JStreamer, and they started to add, they started to customize GCC because they could, and then they started to basically add Qt5 and everything and everything. So basically, in the end, uh, the RDK project and the MSO, I mean, the companies like Comcast, even though they actually own the platform, if you actually look at what's running on their own platform, they actually didn't own much of it. So that was a very big problem. So the, the base port has the whole, the whole power to actually control what went into the product. And that was because, mostly because, I mean, of the, the build scalability issues and, and the, the, the intrinsic issue because of the build systems. So what happened, we started this project together and we, we sat down and we basically wanted to unify all the build systems and, and all the various uh, vendors and, and use cases from the RDK into like a single build. Uh, we definitely wanted to address the ownership and the responsibility, so the MSO and people on the layers above should be responsible for, the, for most of the software. And, uh, and, and yes, I mean, of course, I mean, Yocto Project was I mean, chosen as the platform uh, to build this system. Uh, the, and then we wanted to also address the other kind of issues like being able to much easier uh, upgrade the system and, and more importantly we wanted to make it very easy for like a new base port vendor, like if you, if you want to port this uh, set-top box software to a new SOC vendor, that should be very trivial. Or if we, on the other hand, if we wanted to add a new user of the RDK, uh, like a new MSO company, uh, system, it should also be simple for them. So that's, that's the kind of, that was the, the goals uh, when we started the project. So when we, we ended up with this thing, which looks more, much more better, uh, basically everything uh, is actually coming from the Yocto project, from the open embedded side. So most of the software you need to actually run Linux already exists and it's already supported by the project. And then you start stacking stuff um, and layers of software on top. So you have all the generic APIs uh, that are needed, or frameworks um, that are needed to run the RDK, and then the customization from the uh, specific MSO, I mean, like for example, Comcast. And then eventually you basically had the, the small pieces that you expect, like uh, how do I get uh, my GPU to work, how do I get to boot, and these kind of things uh, for the base board. So uh, this is actually an interesting diagram. Uh, it shows at the end of this project, which was more or less like a year, uh, even maybe eight months maybe, uh, we were able to basically port uh, the existing RDK to three different um, vendors, like one was uh, an ARM, uh, MIPS, and an Intel platforms. Uh, we had a single build, um, and that's single images. Everybody was actually using the same image. Everybody was using the same um, tools and configurations, and you just change and just give the machine name, and you would be able to generate a new image. When you look at the content of the image, that's actually a graph that was made from that. If you look at every file of the image, and if you look where these files are coming from, basically that tells you that uh, three quarters of the system comes from recipes, metadata, which are actually coming from uh, open embedding. It comes for free. So which looks much better than if you remember the, the, the previous pyramid I mean, from before. So you definitely own the complete system. And the base port now is a very small, it's actually one of the small part of the system, which is exactly how you would expect things to be. So what that means is that now 75% of your system comes for free, which means if you want to upgrade, or if you want to make any change, uh, you can apply that change and it will be deployed to all your, uh, all your variations, all your flavors of the LDK for all your vendors. On top of that, uh, what we also realize is that if we, uh, one issue that uh, the, uh, that the, the development, team, so the, there is the, the, the platform itself, but then there are all the applications that actually runs on the set-top box, they were developed on the hardware themselves. What we realize is if we, instead of building for a specific hardware, we would just build for QMU x86, we would be able to just run the same image that actually runs on real hardware on the emulator. So basically, uh, people who don't care about the low-level stuff and only care about providing ap applications uh, for your MSO, they could actually develop on the, on the PC, just, I mean, without even worrying about the board. So that was a very nice addition that was not planned at the beginning, that just came for free by actually choosing uh, to do what we decided to do. Okay, so 
So I think, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to differentiate where it mattered, and we understood that bail system is critical. It's, uh, um, it's actually a backbone, and you need to have a strong one. And that's where, you know, Yocto Project uh, helped. Um, we could go to different SOC vendors, and, you know, they basically had a consistent system to deliver into. Um, and obviously, once they did it for one, and they could easily reuse it for other projects. Um, and uh, eventually, it also helped our kind of like lowering the bar of entry for a newer SOCs. Um, so that was an added advantage because, um, you know, you were not like RDK wasn't vertically integrated. Um, and that provided uh, a lot of, um, you know, benefit to um, because RDK is run, actually it's an open project, uh, so therefore, you know, different users have different needs, they have different SOCs, and it's very important that a new SOC can easily be ported, um, RDK, into their ecosystems, and, um, and then we could define standard health um, that we could then ask various uh, porters to work on. So essentially, as you can see, as the triangle kind of, you know, inverted, that gave a lot of stability at the bottom, and um, that gave a consistent set of health that we could work with, right? So, um, and obviously, we also had a lot of community knowledge about building systems, which also helped in uh, growing the RDK community, especially on the platform side. Uh, and we could offer rich set of tools and packages for new app writers. Uh, so they have a lot of dependencies, right, uh, on applications they develop. And in many cases, you would get a bundle, right? And on embedded systems, uh, you, you don't want to ship three different versions of the same library m most of the time without any solid reason. Uh, so this helps you to kind of, you know, shed some weight in that area as well when, because your platform is common. Um, so, um, so it ended up, you know, in creating this uh, a standard template for us that basically also helped us to uh, scale vertically into our stack and also scale horizontally that I'll cover a little bit. So, um, because now we could focus on where uh, it really mattered, as I mentioned. So you would see that, uh, you know, our teams came up with a few interesting components, essentially Vesteros, which is a VLAN compositor, very small, has like embedded focus, can do nested compositions, and, uh, and is very suitable for like a set-top box operating system. Similarly, we have a, uh, a UI engine that you can do uh, native application rendering. Uh, there's an SDK that we came up with because you know, all it's based on open embedded, and the SDK uh, features that we have. Um, we could basically uh, have uh, uh, WPE, which is uh, um, basically a, a web kit for, you know, uh, on top of uh, um, Wayland, and it's kind of optimized for embedded systems. And OpenCDM, so, you know, as you can see, what it's a, a video-specific tasks, but what it ended up was filling in the gaps where we really needed to concentrate. Um, um, and then we went horizontal, which means that there were different, started with video, but then there were more projects uh, like broadband routers, um, you know, uh, cameras, smart cameras, uh, Wi-Fi access points, Wi-Fi mesh. Um, we could scale horizontally because given the scalability that we have, flexibility we have, we could create, you know, different profiles, still use same tools. So uh, we could create images which are really, really small, and then we could go across, have very complex stacks, as I showed with the video, for example. So uh, this provided a very solid uh, baseline to go into those directions that where we are today after a few years. Um, so um, one of the pain points were build times when we had our own build system. Our build times were uh, linear, you know, it, they were humongous because we didn't have any build acceleration technologies uh, underneath and we didn't do shared, uh, like common builds. 
And those were like straight away benefits we got from Yocto. Um, and uh, incremental bills were huge. Um, shared state, another feature of Yocto that we use today is uh, a very good first time experience for somebody checking out a new tree and trying to do builds. And uh, there's a lot of documentation. I know that um, there's a bit of uh, uh, probably um, unknown in that people uh, probably don't know. It has a lot of specific use cases. If you go through the mega manual, everything is in there. Um, so we started there, and our developers really loved it from going from zero documentation to you know, a ton of documentation. And as a result, actually, they came up with FAQs that were specific to RDK. Right? And that's very valuable for us. They have uh, certain playbooks that they have created uh, that are specifically based on the documentation that the Octo project provides. If you're doing something similar internally, that you know, I recommend that uh, for your own use case to you know, uh, train your own developers. That helps a lot. And uh, uh, obviously, we use the licensing tools for our compliance. And we have uh, testing infrastructure that we indirectly depend upon all the testing that is happening on emulators, for example, in the Octo community. Um, and then we also rely on the security patches um, that are being you know, done by the community. And um, uh, previously, they were all onus was on us. So you know, there's a lot of uh, benefits in that section that we have been having. Um, there are challenges, of course. Uh, learning curve, main reason for that was adopting uh, a different software. And um, the cultural change, where instead of you know, having an internal build system, now you have an open source build system. So uh, it wasn't more about, OK, it's hard, but it's different. Uh, and you have to get to know the processes and how to work with it. Uh, developer workflow. Uh, when we deployed the Octo project, it had a lot stronger release focus. Um, that problem was fixed, but then developers uh, ended up with uh, you know, a suboptimal workflow, or at least they wanted an improved one. And then we worked with the community, actually, uh, on the dev tool um, uh, project that was added, actually, to Yocto project in the past three to five years. And um, that solves a lot of the issues that were reported by the developers in their uh, workflow improvements. Um, the project upgrade is always an issue. And we um, basically find that there could be some improvements in there. Um, where you know we could rely on a more collaborative release that can be maintained for a lot longer, maybe a few years. Um, so there are kind of ideas around those, but um, you know that's actually a challenge. Uh, once you deploy it, how often you can upgrade, and how much effort it should be. So uh, we have a focus on that, where we want to make that nimble, basically have easy way to upgrade. Um, and then obviously, you know, the build time improvement was there, but then, of course, you know, more is always better. And um, there has been features that has been coming into Yocto uh, that we basically will, um, will, will work on uh, deploying even into RDK. Hash equivalency is one of the latest features where it can do a much better job identifying something not to be rebuilt. So. Um, so I think there's a detailed talks if you're attending Yocto Summit. Uh, you can talk to experts, find more about it. But uh, it's, a, it's a very cool feature. It's kind of a game changer in the, um, in the build area, I think, essentially, where you can now deploy your pre-built artifacts um, smartly and not end up rebuilding things accidentally. So um, that kind of gives a much better, um, you know, uh, view for end users too, when uh, they don't have false rebuilds happening. So um, yeah, so I think um, having said that, um, that's pretty much I wanted to share. So if you have any questions or comments, or you'd like to ask specific questions, because this has been happening over years, I might have forgotten many things that you know we went through. I would be happy to answer, and Nico, of course, from project point of view. The, the main reason why we've 
wanted to, I mean, have this talk here was to basically explain, I mean, how we actually did solve like a real life problem. I mean, it's, it's been a big uh, success story, uh, both on, on both sides, actually, on, on, the, on the Octo project side. I mean, is it, I mean, this is like a huge user base for the, for the Octo project, but that's also a good success story for you, as you've seen. I mean, by focusing less on things that you don't care, you can do more. I mean, that's, that's the basic thing that we always say, but we now have like some, some really good evidence of that. Yeah. So, any uh, and and what has been done once, I mean, it can actually be done in different uh, you know, ecosystem as well. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, what was the particular um, challenge in adopting uh, open source culture? <laughs> yeah. I guess that's for you. It's a, um, so essentially, I think um, look, change is always hard, right? And um, one of the challenge you always have is you're familiar with something. But uh, sometimes, you, you know, one of the things you, you have to realize your development teams is, and they will always say, we are doing well, we are running fast, right? But you have to tell them it's a hamster wheel that you're running on. Right? So that's the challenging part. How do you make them realize that? That uh, the, the things that you've been doing are suboptimal, right? And so in many cases, we did that uh, where we basically created you know, parallel workflows, right? And demonstrated that what we do today and what we can do in future, um, and then contrasted them. So a lot of, kind of these kind of documents do exist where we do compare and contrast certain things that were strong points of uh, culture. So uh, you have to approach it from data-based. Um, um, it has to be backed by data, right? So preaching doesn't work, all right? So many times people know it is the right thing to do, um, but if you have to make it effective, you have to back it up with data. So we always created use cases where we then uh, went to the people with data and they realized that this is a better way of doing things. So uh, that was, I think, one of the learning that, um, you know, uh, the, and once you present the data, it's a very compelling case to adopt. And, and speaking about data, this diagram where I was showing this 75%, I mean, we actually, this, this is a slide we showed I mean, the management say, I mean, this is what we've done. I mean, this is data. This is not just what we would like to do. This is what has been done. And this is how much you can actually save. I mean, this is real data. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've presented that to the management at that time. Yeah, so I think you have to pick the battles. And you will know those internally in your own companies and organizations, what the battles are. Right? In many cases, people might have acceleration tools already deployed. right? And then, but there might be different uh, challenges that you're running into, but the template is always the same. Collect data, right, and then compare and contrast, and then, um, then talk about the benefits. A lot of trainings, uh, that helps too. Uh, if you are like uh, newcomers, right, and many times people are eager to learn, but uh, trainings is actually one of the big things that help them to onboard quickly. So think about trainings quite a lot, right? And specific trainings to your use cases. You know, many times, you know, you might not want to do, I mean, everything is not relevant to you. So just call out which areas will be the onboarding areas that you want to do. So sometimes that helps quite a lot with your teams. And, and, and from the project's perspective, we, we are very well aware that, I mean, this is, there is a very, I mean, difficult learning curve. I mean, this is, I mean, nobody, denies that. So what we try to do is we, we this is also why we organize, I mean, um, developer days at each of these conferences. Uh, you might have attended some of this. Uh, we also have provide and actually support a really good documentation as well. Uh, we are always open to, I mean, how we could do more and, and, and better things. And there are lots of uh, companies, I mean, out, I mean, out there that actually can help you and train your teams. Uh, I mean, in many different languages, everywhere. So we try to make sure that um, within the ecosystem, we actually enable these companies. So that's what we try to do. More questions? How did your um, developers react to uh, adopting such a change in the build 
like chain of your product. Uh, because most of the times what I've seen is that developers don't really care about the integration in their build process. They only want to code their component and then somebody else handle the entire chain of deployment integration and that, that all. Yeah. Um, have you included some of these activities in their garden or are you handling completely independent of them? Yeah. So I think it's a very good question. So I think if you see the triangle, it's always a, it's a funnel, right? So you got like system developers, kernel developers, handful of them, and then you know you got like middleware, and then you got like a large set of application people. And so uh, we did talk about emulator, for example, right? So you have to kind of create those those use cases where they feel happy about. Because you know that you are changing underneath things that will make them unhappy. So, um, so once you have like an emulator-like platform where they can develop their app and test their app 80%, uh, that's a big boost for them because they realize that doing 100% on this app on a puny device is very painful. I mean, think of debugging, you know, WebKit even on Raspberry Pi 3, you know, the stack traces don't show up for 10 minutes, right? right? So that's the practical problem. But when you can provide additional tooling where you say, hey, you know, the process is going to remain the same, so uh, ease out their workflow. And they are, they are basically um, more susceptible to accept the changes that you're bringing in. Uh, you also have to approach it from the process side where you know you have the DevOps team. So we basically in, in large developer teams, process has to be there. So you have to basically look at take a very hard look at the process you have and then design the tools to fit in into your process. Many times those are not pretty. And you know we might have a tool that is pretty neat, but you might need to add glue to it to basically rough the edges so you can ride into the developer uh, workflows. And then once you are in there, then you can make like optimizations, improvements. But I think, uh, again, that's use case by use case. I think the changes are very common. But what I saw was if you were to say, hey, you know, I'm changing your workflow, they would simply say no. Right. But if you say, here is a better way of doing it, uh, would you like to adopt it? And then they adopt to that. And then you can change the workflow for release and all those things. So we found that's more effective, but uh, there is a consistent resistance that you will always have. So if your developers are not happy, it won't fly. So um, essentially, I think, uh, of course, you have to measure a lot. Uh, you know, sometimes we forget about that, but we put in a lot of measurements. For example, our auto builders measure build times, and they plot them over time, right? So, you know, if you use Jenkins or whatever, it might not have that feature built in. You might have to build that on top, right? So, what it gives you is it gives you insight into what it is doing, right? Is it bringing any benefits, right? And how it is going, right? As developers adopt it, is it getting worse? It is getting better. So, um, so I think um, more data-based approach and then understanding the inflection points where you can insert those workflows. So uh, I, I find that very useful and people are very open to adopt. It might sound very counterintuitive, but you had data where, I mean, it was showing that using the RDK after the Octo project, they actually save build time. So I mean, if you, if, I mean, most of the complaints that we hear about the project is build takes a long time and download and everything. But then if you actually apply that to a real, I mean, if you only make one image, yes, maybe it's long. But then if you actually use that on your daily for like plenty of images and plenty of machines and everything, and you actually start making a count of how much you save, I mean, you did, you do end up saving a huge amount of actually uh, right. build time. Yeah, and I think there's another thing where you try to basically, I've seen you try to push it through. Um, you have to identify your users pretty well. And in many cases, an SDK, an application SDK would make perfect sense, right? And if you push the whole build system into them, that might not be the you know, optimal solution. 
So you have to work through those depending upon the use cases. So the beautiful thing about uh, Open Embedded Yocto Project tooling is that there is a, a set of tools you have available to you. Now how you use it to improve the productivity and you know, effectiveness of your developers uh, would be slightly different. So one, time, one size won't fit all, right? So if you have like 10 developers, maybe just using the full build system is fine, but if you have 500 developers, right? You might want to give them a consistent um, platform to work on. And you might want to have a more federated model where you, know, you have application development, you have a platform development happening separately, and then devise a CI system basically which marries both of them. So, uh, but you can think about those things because now you have a solid platform. That's my message for everyone. Okay, so I guess we are on time. Um, one thing, just last word, uh, we are here, I mean, the Yocto project is here at the conference. We are the showcase and we have a booth. So there, will, there are lots of people from the project here. So if you have any questions, wants to talk about anything, uh, yeah, you can just come and see us. And then uh, we also have uh, on Thursday and Friday a two-day conference about the Yocto project. So uh, if maybe some of you will come there. Uh, this is the first time we do that. We do a two-day conference. Uh, we call that the Yocto Project Summit. And the hope is to basically put users of the project and developers into the same home and just talking together and just showing us what people are doing with the Yocto project. So I encourage you to actually um, learn about that and just obviously come and talk to us. Thank you. Okay, thank you.